Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. Well, last weekend was very cool. We had our annual miracle offering weekend, uh, sacrificial that was, and uh, believing God for miracles. And I don't know whether you know it or not, but really let me just talk for a moment about it. A miracle is a miracle because it's out of the ordinary. Uh, if you and I could do it, it's not a miracle, right? If we could do it on our own strength, it's not a miracle. A miracle is really something extraordinary. Uh, you can't explain it naturally. People do try to explain it naturally. I was talking to a gentleman down in Queenstown just this past week, and uh, he was, uh, wanted to debate certain things. And, you know, he said, oh, Jesus was a carpenter, so he probably built a wharf out to walk on, you know? Um, I mean, other people have said, well, he walked on, on a reef, a hidden reef. The trouble is, of course, there are no hidden reefs in the Sea of Galilee. I've actually been there. But uh, people try to explain miracles. I mean, even the miracle of Moses, uh, all the plagues of flies and the, and the locusts and different things, uh, many people blame that on global warming at the time. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, but enough to say people try to explain it away. But miracles are supernatural. You cannot understand miracles with your own natural mind, even though many try. And the reason why people try and want to explain it away is because if they did accept that there were miracles, and even though some even atheists, like, I mean, even some doctors, not all doctors are atheists, by the way, we've got doctors sitting here, but, but uh, many doctors, even who don't believe in God, have seen miracles and can't explain things. Uh, I mean, not only that, scientists see things they can't explain, Right. But the thing is, is often people want to explain things because for them to acknowledge miracles are really acknowledging that there's a supernatural force at work in the universe. And of course, so they might say he's a force, but God is not a force. He's not just an intelligent force. He is a person from the point of view. He's got a heart. He's got eyes. Amen. And you and I are made in his likeness. Amen. So I'm here to say today that as far as miracles go, church, we can not only accept them, and not only expect them, but we need to believe for them. Can I hear an amen to that? And so the Bible itself, let's be honest, is a miraculous book, if you know anything about the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it is filled with the workings of God. And God has put laws onto our planet for you and I to live by to help us. And they can help us bring about some miracles in our lives. Let me explain a couple as we go along today. But there's some natural laws that are really supernatural laws, like the law of gravity. I mean, they're still trying to work out exactly how it all works, but it's a law that God put here for our own good and our own protection, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be floating around too far, too much. Imagine trying to find your car keys. So the thing is, is God has put other laws there, the law of sowing and reaping. It is there for us to use, right? But growth is miraculous. And so I want you to remember that life itself is a miracle. I don't know whether you know it or not. I mean, we looked at that photo of that little baby, and most mums would know as soon as they hold their baby, they're looking at a miracle. But, you know, think about your fingerprint. One in eight billion people. That's a miracle. Your DNA, which is obviously more advanced than, than a fingerprint, but is so unique. You're the one of a kind. You are a miracle. Can I talk about the planet? Our earth is a miracle. The way it is finely tuned in the universe to sustain life. There's not another like it. They haven't found one in any case. The solar system is just a giant tick-tock clock. We've got daylight saving coming up. But enough to say, the way that it all revolves and keeps together is a miracle. Can I talk about our universe go a little bit bigger? Do you know how big it is out there? It's an absolute miracle, and only God can do that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light, amen? And God spoke it forth. And the Bible says, as God spoke it forth, we too speak and believe. Can I hear an amen? We have believe and we speak. And so therefore, the words that we say need to be faith and life. Too many Christians are not living blessed life because they speak negative things. They speak doubtful things. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't even claim it when I got a cold. Who wants to own a cold? 
I've got a cold. I don't have a cold. A cold may be trying to get a hold of me. And you might say, that's ridiculous, Peter. Well, that's the way I live. Even though the cold may be trying to get a hold of me, I don't want to own that thing. I'm just saying, all right? And so the thing is, is that we believe, therefore we speak. And from the very beginning, there were miracles. In the beginning, as I said, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke it into being. And we see man stepping onto the pages of history into the promises of God, declaring God's word, believing and speaking and seeing miracles come about. It started, to be honest, miracles with Moses. Now, the first miracle Moses saw, the burning bush, he had nothing to do with. He, he got as big a surprise as you and I would. And then the rod that God gave him, he cast it down and became a servant. Moses got a fright also. God had to train him, <laughs> disciple him in the working of miracles. You see Moses growing, and he starts to declare to Pharaoh, God said, set my people free. And God, Moses started to speak the miracles of God. So Moses was a miracle-working man. No two ways about that. Joshua followed in his footsteps. We know that uh, Moses, part of the Red Sea, which is, they say, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, and uh, Joshua, he part of the River Jordan at the time of flood. Not only that, of course, he's more well-known for the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. And then as you continue through the Bible, you've got two major prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, uh, he performed eight miracles. Elisha, the double portion man, who got the double portion, performed 16 miracles. And these were no small miracles. They raised dead people. That's, that's out there. They made an axe head float in water. They healed a, purify, uh, a poison stew. Lepers got cleansed by them. I mean, they had some pretty cool miracles happen to them. And then, of course, the minor prophets came along, and a lot of them didn't perform miracles, but they lived miraculous lives. They had favor upon them, and God was looking after them. I think about Jonah and the whale. Interesting, just the other day, a guy got caught in the, in the mouth of a whale. I don't know if you saw that. They said it happened by mistake. The whale didn't mean to get him. How did they figure that one? But I don't know. Probably didn't. But enough to say that there was recently, about uh, five decades ago, a man swallowed by a whale, and he survived. And, of course, Jonah uh, got swallowed by the whale for three days. And God's hand was upon him. I mean, that's a miracle, being spat out by the whale. There was only two ways out of the whale, and I know which way I'd rather come out. And, and, and so not only that, but, of course, he went and preached to a city, Nineveh. I'm growing in my English language. I used to say Nineveh. And the whole city repented. I mean, the greatest crusade of all time, that was a miracle. I don't recall Abraham, the father of all who believed himself performing any miracle. He was definitely a man of faith. He had some miraculous things happen to him in his lifetime. And he's a man of faith when he's taking his son up the mountain, and you know for what. And he said to his servants, you stay here, and me and my son will go and worship, and we will return to you. And when his son said, where's the sacrifice, dad? Dad said, God himself will provide a lamb. Here's a man of faith. But he himself didn't perform any miracle like Elijah and Elisha and like Moses and like Joshua. But, of course, you and I know that he did have a child at 100 years of age. And he had to perform to get it, by the way. It wasn't a miraculous consumption. I mean, that's a miracle, Right? There was no Viagra around at that time. I'm just saying. And it was a, a miracle. Let, 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 let's look in the book of Romans because he believed God for it. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. For the promise, everybody said the promise. The promise. See, if you've got a promise, you want to hold on to that promise. Even though you may be past the point, you want to hold on to that promise. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, not through the law, not through the old ways, but through the righteousness of what? Faith. For if those of the law, the Old Testament, doing it, trying to do it yourself, it is faith is made void. And the promise has no effect because the law brings about wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith. Everybody say faith that we might be according to the grace. We sang 
faith and grace this morning among the wonderful songs we sang. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Everybody say the seed. See, to get a miracle, you've got to sow a seed. Just being quiet in this holy place. Not only to those, it's like Josh said this morning, great, 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 great thought. It was a pretty small bit of flour this woman had and small oil too. There's two stories. But it wasn't small to them. It was all they had, like the woman with two mites, right? All right, let's move on. But also to those who have faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, he believed God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Exactly like Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things unseen, things hoped for, right? You've got to be able to see it, <laughs> have a vision for it. You can't see it in the natural, it's not there, but it's coming. Who in contrary to, ho to hope, and hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. Spoken. Are you getting it this morning? Faith, promise, believe, spoken. So your descendants should be. I'm trying to help you get a miracle this morning. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he's about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief and was strengthened in what? In faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore was accounted to him righteousness. Now it is written for his sake alone that it was not imputed to him, but also for us it will show, be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead Last verse, 25, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised. Jesus was raised because of our justification. It's interesting, uh, talking about uh, the Muslim faith and the Quran. The Quran actually has Abraham doing a couple of miracles, uh, being in a fire and his ropes not being burned, a little bit like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a little bit like the Apocrypha, uh, other books uh, that some claim to be part of the Bible, but aren't. They weren't canonized. Uh, the Apocrypha has Jesus as a boy making clay pigeons and, and making them fly. But it's not in the Word of God. It's not in this Bible. And so we hold this Bible as the infallible Word of God. Can I hear an amen to that? And so Abraham, I don't see him doing any miracles. He had a miraculous favor upon his life like Jonah and others. I don't recall Joseph performing any miracles himself, apart from the interpretation of dreams, which is pretty cool. But uh, he also believed that one day the children of Israel would be free from Egypt, and when they were, uh, he, they were to take his bones with them back to the promised land. So he lived a life of faith, and he had the favor of God upon him to live a miraculous life, as you know, in Potiphar's house and in prison and so forth. Daniel, talk about a man who had the favor of God. He also could interpret dreams, had words of wisdom, words of knowledge, had prophetic utterance, but he didn't raise any person from the dead or live a miraculous life or, or perform miracles. And yet when he got put into the lion's den, it doesn't say that he shut the mouth of the lions. It said that God shut the mouth of the lion. Surely love and mercy shall peace be found by you. So in any case, Daniel had the favor of God upon him. God shut the mouth of the lions. But he didn't, as I said, not like Elijah and Elisha, but throughout the Old Testament, there were plenty of miracle happenings, both from God, God's sovereignty, and both from man, man's responsibility. Hello, you and I are called to live that. We are called to believe God, that God's favor is upon us. God will bless our lives. He will watch over us. Hallelujah. He'll cause things to happen. But likewise, we are also called to believe and speak and see miracles come about. See, Jesus comes along. And what's the first miracle that Jesus did? Completely out of the box, completely to upset religious people like Pentecostals. He turns water into wine, right? First miracle. Such an extravagant miracle. I've spoken about it before, how much that wine was worth. I mean, let's be honest. It didn't, 
it didn't do any good for the people apart from making them go to the toilet more. I mean, you know, to be honest, it, it, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't like healing the blind that already drunk freely, the Bible says. And so he does this miracle, which is completely out of the box because God won't be boxed, amen. He does things that are way beyond our expectation. And so he turns this water into wine. And as I said, it was like one of a kind. But then he goes on to heal the lepers. He goes on to, and it's interesting, by the way, that after he turned the water into wine, the Bible says, then his disciples believed in him. Uh, okay, I won't go there. But he healed the lepers. <laughs> Be like following a mini tanker around. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. In any case, he, <laughs> he caused the deaf to hear. See, I just got all the religious people upset right there. Cause the deaf to hear. It's like following a doctor around now. He cast out demons. Very possessed people. People who were chained up. He walks on water. He calms a raging storm. He feeds multitudes a couple of times, 4,000 and 5,000. And that's just counting the men on a couple of fish and seven loaves and five loaves. I mean, some would say that's the greatest miracle of all. He raised the dead and he heals multitudes of sick people because people say, well, how many miracles did Jesus do? And you can count some of the miracles, but many times in Scripture it says he healed all that came to him, the whole village at times. And so we don't know how many miracles he did, but we know Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he healed her and the woman who followed him and touched the hem of his garment, some people he laid hands on. Other people he just spoke to, some just touched him, some he spat upon, <laughs> some he shoved clay in their eyes. I mean, he did all kinds of things so people basically wouldn't, you know, box him in, right? And he heals a blind man, and the interesting thing is the Bible says when he healed that blind man, it really upset people. Why did it upset people? Because it says that that had never been done before. And I think about Elijah and Elisha. They raised dead people. They healed the leper. But they never made a blind person see. In fact, the most common miracle Jesus did was the blind people seeing. See, unless you see, <laughs> unless a penny drops, unless a light comes on, you live in darkness. The disciples followed in Jesus' footsteps as he told them to. In fact, he said, greater things will you do than I do. He said, whatever you do according to my will, whatever you ask for, it shall be done. And the disciples went about. They healed the lame. They, they, they healed the sick. They raised the dead. They cast out demons. But then Paul got this idea, and he laid his hands upon cloths and handkerchiefs, and people would take those handkerchiefs, something that Jesus never did, and they would give them to sick people, and they would be healed. Peter, as he walked through the town, his very shadow would fall on people and they would get healed. Talk about expectation. I don't read about Jesus' shadow ever healing anybody. I'm sure he could have. What am I saying, friend? I'm just saying that the Bible endorses and enforces miracles and endorses and enforces us speaking and believing miracles over our lives but also expecting God <laughs> for a miraculous life, for the favor of God. So I ask you the question this morning, in conclusion, what do you think is the greatest miracle in the Bible? I mean, there are several of them to choose from, and let's be honest, even Jesus, as I asked a couple of people this morning, Jesus rising from the dead, and let's be honest, that's a pretty good miracle, the reason it's a, a good miracle, better than the other miracles of other people raising from the dead, is because no one laid hands on Jesus. No one was even praying for him to come back from the dead. No one believed that he would. The disciples were in hiding, and the women who really were the, the, the like better believers than the men, they even went to the tomb to anoint Jesus, a dead body. And so for him to come back from the dead without anybody believing or praying or laying hands was, was a miracle. But death could not hold him down. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. He was sinless and therefore the grave could not hold him. And so sure was a miracle in him when there is no sin. And it's true that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Was that the greatest miracle? I think of other pretty good miracles, Moses, he did pretty good, you know, to get water out of a rock in the desert. 
You're in a desert, you've got three million people following you. It gets pretty dry in a desert. People will drink Kool-Aid in a desert to survive. I'm talking about, you know, engine fuel or whatever. They'll drink anything when they, you know. So you've got three million people. And you've got to get water for them. To get water out of the rock, that's a pretty cool miracle right there. To feed the manna from heaven. But I think about Elijah. Because, you know, I planted a whole lot of plants this year. And, you know, we had a pretty dry summer. And I was praying that they wouldn't die. And we had to water them and so forth. And, you know, but the thing is, is that Mo, uh, Elijah, he shut up the heavens for three and a half years. He said, by my word, by my word, it shall not rain for three and a half years. That's a pretty, pretty cool miracle because... Let's be honest, you know, we only had to hold out for three months here. Possibly, I think, the greatest miracle in the Bible was performed by Joshua. And as I said, he didn't do many. He parted the Jordan River. He's known for the walls of Jericho, which most people would think of Joshua, the walls of Jericho tumbling down and but there's a greater miracle, and some of you would know it, but in Joshua 10, he's fighting a battle. He's fighting a battle, and they're running out of daylight. And so in verse 12, it says, Joshua spoke with the Lord. Can I just tell you right now, church, a key to live a miraculous life and a key to get miracles is to speak to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. I would have loved to have overheard that conversation. I wonder what God said and what he said, but enough was said that Joshua, and it says in the front of everybody, so, you know, because sometimes when we want a miracle, we kind of go off by ourselves and we pray in case nobody will hear us because we don't want to be made to look a fool if it doesn't come about, right? So Joshua, in the presence of everybody, takes a bold statement and says, sun, moon, stand still. Now, to stop the solar system, is pretty cool. Because the earth had to stop rotating. You might say that's impossible. Obviously to you it is. But God who created the heavens and the earth, nothing's impossible. If he can create it, he can stop it. The interesting thing is most civilizations in the world have that day in their history. And the interesting thing, because it's such an out there miracle, I don't think it's anywhere else, but the Bible, the Bible actually quotes another book to verify it. Interesting. It says, <laughs> let me read it to you. It says, is it not written in the book of Jasha? Jasha was another book at the time written, as there were many other books, the book of Enoch and so forth. And, and the Bible quotes another book to verify that this actually happened. And it says in verse 14, there's never been another day like it before or after. Probably God thought there's too much trouble. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> but I mean, this is a major deal. So what I'm saying is there's nothing too hard for God. You're believing for your miracle. Think about that one. All these prayer requests. I want faith to arise in your heart. I want you to be expectant and believing. And whether it takes 100 years like Abraham, surely it will come about. Let expectation be your stance. To live a miraculous life. Let's read Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, and I'm nearly through. But our Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Man, we used to sing that song. You show loving kindness to thousands, repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of the children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, you are great in counsel, mighty in work. For your eyes are open to the ways of the Son of Man to give them according to His ways, according to the fruit. Everybody say the fruit of His doings. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt to this day. In Israel, among other men, you have made yourself a name as it is this day. You have brought your people out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. Sorry, brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders and a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Can I just add what I do believe, really, is the greatest miracle of the Bible? And it wasn't the sun standing still, even though that's very cool. And it's not healing the sick or the oppressed or even bringing dead people back to life. But I believe the greatest 
miracle in the Bible. It is called the incarnation. How God the creator, the miracle conception, how God the creator of heaven and earth would come to life as a human being. Born of the Virgin Mary and live among us. Emmanuel, God with us. And then having his own creation, kill him on a tree that he created, burying him in dirt that he made, but of course rising again again from the grave and fulfilling over 300 prophecies that he'd written centuries before. To give life to whosoever believes in him. And listen now, to take out the heart of stone that's in man, And to exchange a heart of flesh. And that happens in the waters of baptism. As we baptize people today, a miracle will happen in their life because of the greatest miracle of all time, of God coming to earth as a man. As we're talking with this person in Queenstown, and Michael was there, and uh, you got to be careful when you talk with people because sometimes people think they know a lot, but they know very little. And he started by quoting a scripture. The scripture he quoted was entirely wrong to what he was saying. But the way he quoted it, it sounds like he knew everything. But, you know, he was saying that, you know, the first commandment is to have no other gods but, but me. And that, you know, if you have Jesus as your God, then you're breaking the Ten Commandments. But, of course, he failed to see that Jesus was God in the flesh. And so I just encouraged him to read the New Testament that he'd never read, but thought he knew it all, to read the Bible for himself and to pray a prayer along the lines of, Jesus, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? And so I asked him if I could pray for him. You know, a lot of people believe a lot of things and build their life on their little philosophy. I want to build my life on this book. And this book talks about miracles. And that I can perform miracles according to the word of God when I believe and speak. But likewise, I can believe for the favor of God and a miraculous life upon my life, right? And so it's indescribable, to be honest, the greatest miracle of all, God coming and living with us. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But he has given us the keys. And as last weekend we had this miracle offering, I want to close with a scripture in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. But I say this, says the Apostle Paul, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now that right there should be enough for everybody to go to another level, if you believe the Word of God. So let each one, verse 7 says, as he's purposed in his heart, Each one give as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make what? All grace, all grace abound to you. Look how this ties in. Grace, giving, abound towards all of you, having all sufficiency in all things. How many things? All things. May have what? Man. Uh, Abundance for every good work. As it is written, he who dispersed abroad has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever. Now look at verse 10. Now he who supplies what? Seed, seed. You've got to sow seed. Seed to the sower, bread for food. Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, which you have been enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving to us to God. For this administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but is also abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Can I just add, because you just read Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 in our Bible reading program, an angel shows up to Cornelius and says to Cornelius, your prayers and your offerings have been heard in heaven. In other words, they were married together to bring about a miracle favor of God to be the first Gentile to receive the Holy Spirit, right? So they were married together, that seed, and abounding through thanksgiving to God. While the proof of this ministry, they glorified God 
for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, for all your liberal sharing with them and all men. Verse 14, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of exceeding grace in you. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Come on, somebody say amen. Some, I can't explain it. I'm doing my best to preach a little bit, but I can't get a whiteboard and show you how God came down and became man, that seed, the firstborn among many, and how he's put these laws, hallelujah. You know, all I can do is share the word of God and let faith arise in your heart that every one of us would step out and live a favored life by the seed that we sow, by the life that we live, by the words that we speak. I see so many Christians not living a blessed life because they, they grumble, they moan, they complain, they speak negatively. Why let those words come out of your mouth? David said, I'd put my hand over my mouth and I'll cause my nose to bleed. And so often, Christians fail to practice the word of God and they live miserable lives because they're miserable. <laughs> I just want to help you get a miracle today. You've got all these requests up here. I mean... I'm believing for you. I was praying this morning. I'm believing. Hallelujah. I live a blessed life. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm walking on water or anything, but I have learned a few things over the years, as I said to that man, and what I failed to say to him, and I, and I often say to people, I say, you know, if you're a motor mechanic and my car breaks down, I'm not going to tell you how to fix it. You're the expert. I'll bring it to you. You know the trouble is with what I do? Everybody thinks they're an expert. All trying to tell me, <laughs> I'm not talking about you, but people out there like this guy trying to tell me, he never read the Bible. Give me a break. I've read it hundreds of times. I know what's in it. I got more Bibles highlighted than you got candy floss. So when your life's broken, hallelujah, come to the right place, to the house of God. Let the man of God pray and believe for you and lay hands upon you. Somebody wants to tell me how to do it and so forth. I've been doing this a while now. <laughs> I just want to help you this morning. I believe this morning I've given you enough to leave this place and say, I'm going to live a miraculous life. I'm going to have miracles, have the favor of God upon me.